This Sasquatch encounter raises more questions than answers, and the ending blew my mind. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy this walk through Sasquatch territory. 23 years ago, I received an anonymous death threat warning me not to share this encounter. 23 years later, and I am an old man with not much time left to live, and I don't have anything to lose. So if they want to take me out for sharing this encounter, so be it. Let's go back 23 years ago, almost 24 now, and I'll tell you what happened. I worked as a security guard for a power plant from 1998 to 03. Not a lot happened on that job. The only real challenge most of the time was trying to stay awake. If you're real talented, you might even learn to sleep standing up. Jokes aside, I took my job very seriously because there were some high stakes involved. I was always armed and prepared to eliminate any threats to security. And one night I was put to the test. We had an intruder, to put it simply. But nothing, none of my training and no amount of weaponry could have prepared me for that night. It wasn't just some drunk trespasser to deal with, it was something from another species, and maybe even another dimension altogether. I still don't know what the hell it was. All signs point to a Sasquatch type creature, but there was more to it, a lot more to it. You'll see what I mean. Around 4.30 p.m. I arrived at the plant, checked in and went to the west guard post. There was an old coffee maker in there and some cheap ground coffee that tasted like dirt in plastic packages. But caffeine is caffeine and I gladly brewed myself some and enjoyed it from a styrofoam cup. I looked out across the fields and saw the snow flying in sheets of icy death and I thought, I'm glad I'm not out there. All of a sudden, a herd of deer darted out from the woods at the end of the field. They sort of huddled in a small pack right in the middle of the snowy plains. I thought, that was strange. Didn't know what would have made them ditch the shelter of the forest like that and head out into the 20 mile per hour winds. Then my mind wandered to hunting when I noticed the size of one of the bucks. Eventually they crossed the road and went out of sight, and I forgot all about it for a while. There was another guard that evening on the opposite side of the plant, 900 feet across. His nickname was Mambo. He was a former police officer and had seen a lot of action before taking a job at the plant. The day of this encounter happened to be January 1st, 2000. I still had a hangover after the New Year's party, and Mambo wasn't feeling any better. His voice comes on the VHF radio and he says, Got any ibuprofen with you, Chris? Yeah, buddy, I said. Matter of fact, I did, and he was more than happy to come over and get some. We had a little chat about our parties and the weather and basic stuff like that. He took a couple pills, smiled, and said, Gonna be a long night, my friend. Walked down the concrete stairwell and closed the door. That was the last I saw of him. I went back to my coffee and grabbed a magazine. All the headlines were about Y2K, that old end-of-the-world theory around the year 2000, when computer systems were supposed to fail and there would be an apocalypse. There was an old boxy computer on the desk, and I looked at it from time to time, wondering if it would explode or something. It was working just fine, but there was a screen at the check-in point with an error. The time and date read January 1st, 1900, instead of January 1st, 2000. And it turned out that was really all there was to that Y2K thing. Some systems didn't support dates past 1999. Even though it wasn't the end of the world, that day would be the end of my life as I knew it. I got tired of reading all the apocalypse theories and put down the magazine. I was watching the sun go down over the flat woodlands to the west when I noticed the security camera monitor was glitching out in my peripheral vision. I turned my chair and rolled over to it, and noticed it was flickering with green artifacts and other weirdness. Occasionally it would black out and then turn on again, but when it turned back on, it would read some sort of internal error message and eventually go back to normal. It only affected the cameras facing the western woods. I radioed Mambo on the east side and asked him if he was getting any errors. He responded immediately and I made out the words, No, but and then his voice went all staticky. 
Say again, I said. And he said something, but it was all staticky, and I couldn't make out what he was saying. I started thinking, maybe there was something to that Y2K stuff after all. I went back to the magazines and read them with a little more interest this time. While I was wrapped up in reading the magazine, the radio turned on again. But this time it wasn't Mambo's voice. It started off as just static, but then it was interrupted with a deafening noise that sounded like screaming. Then, randomly, it switched to a local radio station playing the weather for a few seconds, then back to static. And it looped like that for a few minutes. I had no idea what was happening. It seemed like something was hijacking the radio frequencies. There was something unnerving about it, and I decided I'd walk over to the East Post to see what was up. Figured Mambo might be able to explain it. He knew more about that kind of stuff. I stomped down the concrete stairs, opened the door, and almost went back inside the second I stepped out. The temperature had dropped below 20, and the Midwest wind chill brought it down to around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. I walked the 900 feet to the east side as fast as I could and knocked on the door. Didn't get an answer, and I was freezing to death. I had an extra key with me, so I decided to let myself in. My footsteps echoed up the stairwell, and other than that, I heard nothing. Now, I said earlier that the previous meeting was the last time I saw Mambo, and I wasn't lying. It really was the last time I saw the man as I knew him. Something happened to him in that time interval. And what happened to him? I don't know. I don't think I'll ever know. I turned the corner and saw him on the opposite side of the room, face down on the desk, arms flopped to his side. You all right, dude? I asked. Fell asleep? I went over and shook his shoulder, but he didn't respond. The rolling chair rolled back from under him, and I had to catch him before he hit the ground. He was totally out cold. All the screens on his desk were glitching out too, and the radio was randomly on the weather station again. That monotonous voice still haunts me today. 20 degrees and only getting colder. Northwest winds at 20 miles per hour with 40 mile per hour gusts. I went to the phone to dial for help, but none of the numbers I called worked. There was no sign anyone had broken in, and I had no idea what put my buddy down like that. I remembered the pills and made sure they were just ibuprofen and not swapped with something else. And sure enough, they were just plain old ibuprofens. All I could think was maybe he had an allergic reaction or something. I'm not a medic, and I don't know anything about that stuff, so I knew I needed to get a professional over. The only thing that I knew was that he was breathing, but his pulse was weak. I went back down the stairs and out the door. I decided to head back to my tower, hoping the phone would work there. I ran all the way back and went up the stairs to my desk. Nothing in the world was going to stop me from getting this man the help he needed. At least that's what I thought. Something did end up distracting me. All the security monitors were still blacked out or glitching, except for one. I glanced over at the monitor that was still working as I grabbed the phone and I was met with a face. The most hideous face I'd ever seen was on that screen. It was looking up at the camera and twitching its head side to side like it was snapping its neck. Even in the black and white low resolution monitor, I knew I wasn't looking at a person. It was covered with shaggy dreadlocked hair. Its eyes were bulging like they were about to come out of their sockets and it scowled a look of hatred at the camera. Weird thing is, it had no eyebrows or facial hair. The hair was only on its head and body, and its skin was the color of charcoal. My blood ran cold when I remembered that the camera it was under was 15 feet off the ground. It was only a couple feet away at most, so that thing was easily 13 feet tall. I kept staring at it, and for some reason, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. I couldn't move, and I don't even think I was breathing. It seemed to know I was looking at it, even though it was just on a screen. Its eyes seemed to follow my eyes, and I went into some sort of trance with tunnel vision and everything looking at that thing. I even dropped the phone without knowing it and it hung from the cord. Once it had me locked on it and unable to move, it stopped its aggressive head movements and slowed down. Its eyes relaxed a little bit and it smiled, if you can even call it that. 
Its teeth were surprisingly white, even on that dull screen, but crooked. Still smiling, it raised one hand and pointed at the camera, like it was pointing at me. Then it raised its other hand up and held it next to its head. It stopped pointing at the camera and started pointing to that other hand now, which was making weird gestures that I didn't understand, like some sort of sign language. All of its fingers were like hitchhiker's thumbs, and they must have been double or triple jointed. They bent back in ways that are not humanly possible. It kept pointing at me, then pointing at its hand, making the gestures, then back at me again while smiling and miming different expressions. I tell you, there was something evil about that thing. My buddy was still lying unconscious in the other tower, but I was stuck here in a trance watching the thing on the monitor. Eventually it occurred to me how close the creature was. That camera was less than 100 feet from my location along the north wall. Either way it felt distant, like I was watching some sort of horror show on TV. Somehow, something snapped me out of the daze, and I remembered my responsibilities as a security officer. I didn't know what in the hell that thing was outside, but I knew I needed to confront it one way or the other. My hope was maybe it was just a prankster wearing stilts and a costume. I kept my pistol concealed, afraid that it would somehow watch my movements. I stopped at the bottom of the stairwell to think of how I was going to deal with the situation. I knew based on the camera's location that the trespasser was at the north wall and I decided I'd flank it from the west wall. I would round the corner on it and give it one chance to surrender. That was my plan at least. I opened the door, made sure I wasn't being watched, and ran out from beneath the dim post light towards the front gate. I snuck along the west wall with my pistol ready. I was about to round the corner on the thing, and my adrenaline was maxed out. I raised my gun and steadied my breathing. Then, in one movement, I turned the corner. My heart was in my throat and I was ready to shoot, but there was nothing there. I slowly lowered the gun and then walked towards where the trespasser had been. I went right under the camera where it had been standing. There wasn't even a footprint. I followed the entire west wall and found nothing except for my own footprints I would left on the way. I wondered if I was at the wrong camera, but without a doubt, it was the right one. I was freezing and headed back towards the guard tower to gather my thoughts. I went in and locked the door behind me, walked up the stairs and went right back to that monitor to double check that I would went to the right location. Then things only got weirder. I looked at the monitor, and the creature was back to those same aggressive head movements and neck snapping. I watched intently and started noticing similarities. I had seen the same thing earlier. I recognized all the movements it made and realized that the video was playing on a loop. It wasn't a live feed of the camera, it had been recorded at some earlier time and was just looping on the monitor. Now I'm not some secret service agent, not even close, and I had no idea how to process all this information. I thought maybe it was a distraction of some sort, but beyond that, I didn't know what else to think. I was racking my brains trying to understand what was going on when I remembered Mambo. My absolute first priority was to check on my buddy in the other tower. If he wasn't recovered, I was planning to drag him back to my truck and ditch the plant altogether. I did have some hope that he might have regained consciousness and we could track down the intruder together. I opened the door to his tower and locked it behind me went up the stairs, and he was nowhere to be found. Not even a trace of him. I was without words, man. So now he was missing, there was some spawn of hell lurking around the plant, I had no contact with the outside world, and I had to try to solve all of this without getting my ass killed. It certainly made up for all the years sitting around trying to stay awake at the guard tower, but I was missing those days right then. I took the opportunity to look out over the east side of the property from the windows. There was a hill on that side with a small radio tower set up on top of it, maybe 100 feet AGL. It was too dark to see much on the ground, but the sky still had some light, and the tower was clear as day against the blue. Something caught my attention about three-fourths of the way up the tower. A black object protruded from the side of it, and I noticed it was moving up it. I looked closer and saw a huge shadowy humanoid figure climbing up the tower with long arms that pulled itself up at an incredibly fast pace. It didn't take me long to realize that it had the same kind of hair and head shape as the thing that I saw on the security camera earlier. I didn't know what the hell it was doing up there and what its plan was, but I knew it wasn't good. 
My first impulse was to shoot it down, so I opened a small side window and leaned out, looking up at the creature. I called out to it, but it kept climbing up. I noticed it was using only one arm to climb, while the other was dragging along a large stick. The creature didn't respond to my verbal warnings, so I fired a warning shot at it. It slowly turned its head around and stopped climbing. Its shaggy hair blew in the wind, and it just looked at me for a minute. Then it screeched a scream that sounded identical to the ones playing over the radio earlier. It turned away and went right back to climbing. That screech reaffirmed the fact that it wasn't a human, and I tried to line it up in my gun sights to get a good shot at it. But man, I don't care how big that thing was, it was almost impossible to hit. It was moving around laterally as well as vertically as it climbed up, almost leaping from beam to beam, swinging like an ape. I took a few shots which seemed to fly everywhere except for the target. It finally reached the top and started whacking the stick into the receivers. I saw some sparks fly up as it went ape shit trying to break the components. Turns out it was on the path to its own destruction. It decided to ditch the stick and grab something metal. It got flat out electrocuted. It started spazzing out and lit on fire still holding onto the metal. Eventually it let go and fell backwards a hundred something feet to the base of the tower with a thud. It laid there in a burning heap, not moving. I knew I needed to retrieve its body and send it into some sort of agency or something, so I grabbed a jug of water from under the desk to put the fire out and ran outside. I went out the east gate and headed straight for the burning mass of fur on the hill. Before I could even get to the hill, another huge figure ran out from the adjacent woods and dragged the other away, looking back at me and snarling. It turned out there were more than one, and I didn't know how many there were. I was starting to feel like a little field mouse in that clearing. I had to swallow all my fear and suck it up because my buddy was still somewhere out there, and if I let night take over before getting him to safety, the elements would kill him even if those forest creatures didn't already so I decided to head straight towards the threat. I turned on my flashlight and headed into the woods. I walked at the edge of the tree line, following the perimeter of the property. I was searching for a needle in a haystack out there, and there was hardly enough light to see 20 feet in front of me. Everything was dead quiet, and it felt like every sound I made was being blasted through a megaphone. I was about to call it quits and head back to town to get a search team on the job, when I heard a series of semi-auto shots break the silence of the forest to my right. That was followed by the screeching I heard earlier and more shots. I knew it was Mambo, so I ran right towards the gunfire to help him out. As I got closer, I saw him kneeled behind a large pine tree for cover and exchanging projectiles with the three 10 to 15 foot tall giants hurling stones, sticks, and pretty much anything they could get their hands on at him. One of them tried to flank him and engage in close quarters combat, but I was in range to cut off its attack with a few well-placed shots. It retreated back to the others, and eventually, one of them fell over. There was a last-ditch effort by them, but at that time, we were two versus two, and one wounded on their side, and they seemed to have run out of things to throw at us. One of them acted as a decoy while the other dragged away the wounded, and then the last one followed behind while making wretched noises. That last one. I don't know how he was still standing, man. He must have gained a few pounds of pure lead, because I alone emptied an entire magazine into him, and Mambo added another to that. Eventually they went out of sight and basically disappeared into the forest. I asked Mambo what the status was, and he just gestured for me to follow him. We walked a little ways back towards the plant, I asked him what happened and how he ended up unconscious, but he didn't say anything. Something seemed off about him. We reached the tree line, and he paused for a moment. I walked a little ahead of him, eager to get back and report all this to the authorities. He finally spoke, and last thing he said to me was, It's for your own good, buddy. He was right behind me and I turned around to look at him, but before I could even lock eyes, the handle of his pistol struck me in the temple, and everything went black. I woke up in a hospital and my wife was there. And when I was able to talk, I tried to tell her everything. But she laughed sympathetically and didn't say much. She seemed disappointed I had even spoken. Later in the day I received a phone call from my boss saying that I was fired and not to ever return to the plant or its property again. I asked why and I tried desperately to explain everything again, but he immediately hung up on me. I asked my wife what was going on and why I was fired. She said, oh honey, you're not a high schooler anymore, and laughed cynically. 
I asked her what does that mean, and I ended up finding out someone had snuck into my office that night after I was knocked out and planted a few tabs of acid in my bag to give the impression that everything I saw was a trip. I never even tried acid in high school and I sure as hell would never do that on the job. It was a huge blow to my reputation. I called up Mambo to see if he was behind all that and also to ask him why the hell he pistol whipped me the night before. It went to his voicemail and I found out later that evening that he resigned and left his wife and everything to go up to Canada. I've never heard from that man since and I tell you what, I didn't complain one bit about being fired from that job. I wouldn't work there again if they paid me a million dollars, but I do want my reputation back and I still don't know who was behind that. I have just as many questions now as I did then. Were they Sasquatches I saw? They certainly match every description I've heard, but can they really do all that crazy stuff? Affect electronics, etc.? And who or what wanted to make me out for a fool and suppress what I witnessed? In the end, I don't hold a single thing against Mambo. I reflected on what happened for many days and I really think he was looking out for me in a way I don't know. He knew a lot more than I did about things and he was many years older. In fact, I don't know if he's even alive today, he'd be over 80. I'm sharing this with you Smokey for two reasons. One, because I've not been given a voice to share my encounter without being mocked. And two, Mambo if you are out there and you are watching this, please leave a comment or something. I hope you are okay and I have a lot of questions I want to ask you. Thanks, Chris H.